Good morning, comrades. We're going to have some thoughts and reflections this morning. I want if you would stand with me as we start our reflections on the passing of Her Majesty the Queen. And we'll start with just a, the national anthem and then some silence and then some prayer. Father God, we come to you this morning <clears throat> and we thank you for the life of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. We thank you for her faith and encouragement for over ten, seven decades. Her faith has shone through. Her faith has been one of the most important rocks on which she's built her work and her life. So we thank you for the example that she has been. And this morning, Lord, we pray for His Majesty, King Charles III, who has lost a mother. We think of Anne, Andrew and Edward. And Lord, in these moments, they are sons and daughters of a mother. And we ask that your blessing be on their lives and your presence and support in these days. In such a public way, they are having to grieve. But I pray, Lord, they will sense your peace in these days. For His Majesty, Lord, we pray for endurance and strength as He takes on the mantle of being the sovereign of these lands. And we ask, Lord, that you empower Him and bless Him and let Him know your presence. And in these days of mourning, in these days of reflection, may He sense the many prayers from people all around the world and sense your power in his life. So hear our prayers, Lord, the many that we've heard over these few days and the many that we will say in the days to come. And Lord, we say, God save the King. And we share together a prayer that you taught us. Our Father, <coughs> who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please take your seats.
The general has sent a message across the world and he says this, Salvationists across the world share in sincere sadness following the passing of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Her Majesty was an inspiration around the globe, admired for her faith, grace and devotion to duty. On behalf of the Salvation Army, we offer the royal family our prayers for comfort and strength in these days of grief. Brian Peddle, the general, and our own total commander. We'll listen to him now. Greetings to you from the Salvation Army's territorial headquarters here in London. We're all suddenly having to come to terms with the fact that our beloved Queen is no longer with us. It's the end of an era. And certainly those under the age of 75 have never experienced the change of a monarch like we are experiencing at this time. If you're like me, you may be surprised at the depth of sadness and grief that has bubbled up within us as we heard the news. A sense of deep loss, of, of grief. Even though none of us would claim to have known the Queen personally. Back in 2020, Jill, my wife, and I were given the immense privilege of being presented to the Queen as well as to other members of the Royal Family at Windsor Castle. We were with the Regent Hall Salvation Army Band playing carols to the Queen at her request for she wanted to express gratitude to the Salvation Army and to other voluntary agencies for the great work that had taken place during the pandemic. What a privilege it was for us to meet with her face to face and to realize from conversation with her, her deep desire to serve and to see that her people were being served. What an encouragement and what a blessing it was to be with her. Back in 1947, on her 21st birthday, she famously said, and I read, I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. But I shall not have the strength to carry out this resolution alone unless you join it with me, as I now invite you to do. I know that your support will be unfailingly given. God help me to make good my vow and God bless you who are willing to share it. Psalm 116 and verse 14 says, I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. And she did. And verse 16 says, O Lord, truly I am your servant. And she was. And the verse in between those two verses 14 and 16, verse 15 says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And for Her Majesty the Queen, we are in no doubt that this is true. We are saddened beyond words. We rejoice, however, in her life, her faithful service to God and to her people. And we rejoice in her legacy and the example of her life to love God and to love others. There was a beautiful song which was written for the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, the message of which was that we too, like Her Majesty, following Christ's example, should rise up and serve. And in these days of mourning, I've been encouraged by those words, and I thank God for Her Majesty the Queen. As we journey these sad days, our thoughts and prayers turn to the Queen's immediate family and to King Charles particularly. May he and may the family know the peace of Christ and thus the strength that sustained the Queen throughout her life and reign. But may you also now receive the gift of peace as you too determine to rise up and serve. May God bless you. Amen. Amen. Just want to say thanks to uh, Major John for leading worship last week, and uh, very grateful. And uh, it's, it's strange to be able to look back and watch it 
And uh, it was a great word last week. Thank you, John, for doing that. Today's call to worship has been prompted by our weekend last week. It seems longer than a, a lot has happened this week, isn't it? And last Sunday seems a long time ago. And uh, where Judith and I were at our Servants of God reunion, 40 years since we entered the training college. And it was a great weekend in so many ways. Um, but often we spoke about calling the call and being called. And there was a real mixture of people there. There was those who are still officers, those who are ex-officers, those who are not believers at all, um, who were part of our session, but were there enjoying in the fellowship with us. And it got me, and we spoke about that calling and where they are today. And it got me thinking about us here and this week. And, um, and I don't think it's any accident because the greatest calling that we saw worked out in her life was with Her Majesty the Queen, who was called by God to that role that she believes and, um, and strengthened and supported her through it. But my call to worship is from Isaiah 6, 8, where it says, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will, I, who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. Horatius Bonner wrote in the 19th century, I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am this dark world's light. What would we write about now if we were hearing the voice of God? What words would we put down? What would we say? I heard the voice of Jesus say. We'll think about that a little later, a little more later in the meeting. But let's sing that song together to the... Um, Robert Redhead, arrangement from the musical Salvationist, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Day. Let's stand together and sing it through. Thank you. Amen. Take your seats. What a great arrangement, isn't it? I didn't realise it was 89. I just thought it was a couple of weeks ago. That gives my age away more than anything. Can I have the scene company? Before we do, 
I just want to make comment to uh, Erin. Oh, it's her last Sunday officially before she goes off and learns something. <laughs> Fiona, you're not supposed to applaud. Just to get the house to yourself. And Stephen, take that grin off your face. <laughs> Too happy. Well, Erin, you go with our love. If we could hang on to you, we would. You're a great asset to this core. You really are. And you have been, and I'm sure you will be. You know, working in the Sunday school as a system YPSM and many other things behind the scenes. And also with the Tuesday night cooking. I don't know how I'm going to be able to cook now without Erin telling me how to do it. Um, or actually saying to me, Major, would you just leave the kitchen? <laughs> we will miss you, Erin. Yeah, you're great. You've got a great... God has got her, his hand on you. He really has. And he's going to bless you. I absolutely know that. And you're going to be a leader, however that leader is going to be. Mark that today. 11th of September that I said that because I believe you'll be a leader. It could be in a professional field. But I really ask you to trust God in that leadership, wherever that takes you, because he's got you. And we're very proud of you, and rightly so. So God bless you, Aaron. God help university, but hey, hey, that's what they're there for, isn't it? But uh, you go with our blessing, and uh, we look forward to hearing the news and seeing you when I'm in my dotage and old age and seeing you as a leader saying, yeah, I thought so. The poor people who got to say, no, never mind. But God, God bless you, Aaron. Let's hear the same company. Thank you, Kate. <coughs> Well done, and I, th I think a special round of applause for Sam and Caitlin, I think. Wasn't they great? <laughs> Fabulous. Does that take you back? Hey, how many used to sing that in the sing company? Oh, all those over a certain age. <laughs> Absolutely. It must be old. I remember singing it. Yeah. It's one of those uh, ones that never die, do they? They're just 
you're all singing along with the words. That's really great. Thank you very much. Singing company. Only by grace can we enter. Only by grace can we enter. Lovely song. Band are going to accompany us. We're going to sing it. Not by our human endeavour. Not by us. You know, and I think it's, it's stating the obvious, but sometimes it's the obvious that needs to be stated, that actually coming to God and, and, and allowing God in our lives is not by our endeavours. It's not for how long we've been a local officer, or it's not how long we've been a salvationist, or done this or done that. It's about the grace of God. It's about the blood of Jesus. It's about the fact that we listen to the call of God in our lives, day by day. And those times when we're tempted and we're challenged in life, because we all are, there's no one here who is not. We have to go back to that grace. We have to go back again and again and again. And how do I know that? Because I have to do it. And if I have to do it, we all have to do it. Again and again, we have to go back to that grace. Not, and we try and work it out ourselves, and we can't. Only get, by grace can we enter. It was said this week that Her Majesty the Queen, every night when she prayed, she knelt. I can believe that. I can believe that. That she knelt to pray. Going into the presence of the King of Kings, she would kneel because she knew her position with God. Let's share this together. A couple of times through, please, Ryan. Thank you. Then we'll pray together. Father God, we stand in your presence this morning. We come into your presence. We deliberately put ourselves into your presence this morning. We come to worship this morning. We come into your presence to receive from you, each one of us, to receive that grace for today, to receive that grace for tomorrow, to, to look at our lives from the last few days and 
just say, Lord, we possibly mucked it up. But we thank you for your grace because you just put it all back together again and you love us. And Lord, we want to hear your call today. We want to hear that positive direction in our life from you, Father. We stand on the threshold of so much new beginning in so many ways. And we want to stand on it with you, Lord. We want to understand that grace. We want to understand that call. We want to understand that forgiveness, that salvation. And all how that's wrapped up in our lives. And what it does for us. Where it leads us. How we behave. What we do. Father, let us be that example. Not to just the people in this building, but to those in our neighbourhoods. Those in our communities, in our towns and workplaces. Lord, hear our prayers, we pray. We have many, we have many. But you have the capacity to hear every syllable and answer. And Lord, let us have the capacity this day to hear your syllables speaking into our ears, into our hearts this morning. And we pray our prayers in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's here from the band. Thank you, Brian.
King with a glittering crown on my brow, if ever I love thee. My Jesus, tis now. Amen. Amen. This month it uh, marks the um, big collection. Let's call it South Denard. Do you remember February time? Do we just wrapped up, falling over in the ice and snow, knocking on the doors, asking people for money and thinking they're in their nice warm fires and we're freezing to whatever's out here. And then they changed it to September. We thought that'd be brilliant. Then we used to get wet because it rained all the time. But uh, things change. But um, I'm encouraging you. Okay, so down here we've got some boxes. Um, they cover about 100 years. Um, Mrs. Payne says, when we move, I've got to declutter. So some of this might go, just hide it. She'll never know. And um, over the years, the idea of, of the Salvationists giving to the social work of the Salvation Army has always been there. It goes way, way back. And there was Grace Before Meat boxes, these, uh, this metal one here, and you just put a penny in or whatever, um, coin of the realm anyway, into the box before you said grace and thank God for that meal or you gave up your pudding. Uh, notice I didn't at all. Uh, but um, it, it's that sense of self-denial. And um, I, I think it's a shame that they changed the big collection, that they put the focus on money opposed to the denial. Because the self-denial speaks of what it's all about. We want to deny ourselves, to give something to somebody who's totally denied of anything. You know, I think I would be, yeah, that's another point, another, yeah. Keep to script, shall we? Uh, but I think I'm encouraging you, there's boxes, so they're flat packed. I'm not sending them to you this year so you don't have to pay the postage. And, uh, which I thought was quite kind of me last year. And um, so you take it, okay, you fold it, you build a box. So for those who, you know, got a bit of arthritis, it's good for your fingers, agile. And then just before you have a meal, put something in it. Or if you're, because you don't carry money like uh, some people, you can put an IOU in it. So every day put an IOU at the end of the month. And, or, and we're talking about the 11th of October, okay? At the end of that month, look how many and then send us the money, and it goes to social. We can choose where it goes, which I think is really important. It could go to our own work here within the homeless, or we could say, actually, we're going to look at one of the army centres locally or nearby that we can support. So I encourage you to do that. There's plenty about some in the office, there's some down here. And um, if you take the tin or the black box, for God's sake, care, you have to put pound coins in those. So if you want to take those, and there's a pound coin every day, and I will count those boxes. So if you want to take those two and fill them with pound coins, I'll leave that to you to decide. So, oh, did you want that, Dawn? No? Oh, no, just, just coughing at the thought of giving all those pounds. Uh, so if you want a box, let us know, and you can have them, and you can uh, take them away for our self denial um, support. And there might be other ways you want to do. I suggested in Chatham Chatter about, you know, having a coffee morning in your house with your neighbours. I'll provide you with material and with film clips that you can put on the telly, and, um, you know, some, they know you're Salvationists, don't they? They all know it. So just have me and have a coffee and tell them something about the social work of the Salvation Army. So we'll do that, all right? So really, guys, I wasn't going to mention this, but it's lovely to see Lillian this morning. I wasn't going to mention but Lillian, it's good to see you this morning. God bless you. And uh, we're going to have the offering now, and we're going to use a song as we take up the offering by the peaceful shores of Galilee, mending their nets by the silver sea, looking at that, col that calling again, follow thou me, he calls again, and I'll make you fishers of men. So as we give, we'll sing these words together. Thank you, Emma.
And shall we pray? And dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we have heard that call. We've heard that call to serve you, to give of our time, our talents, our lives, our gifts. We've heard that call from our sovereign to lay our lives before you. Take each one of us that those who know not of that life of service, who have not felt that call through the ministry that takes place within this call, through the time, the talents, all those things that we bring to here and we bring for your service, they may too know of you. Bless these gifts. Bless each one of us. Amen. Thank you, Corps Secretary. So last week we, um, <coughs> excuse me, we introduced our Wednesday night fellowships and uh, doing it slightly different. Here's a motley crew uh, that met on uh, Wednesday evening, the Doctrine uh, group, which is, is being led by Nigel and Margaret Day, and the Bible study by Judith, and the Alpha by myself. And it's really good. We're sharing at 7 o'clock with uh, refreshment, and then going into the groups, and, and learning not in a heavy way. And I put this out uh, because I think we should have double that number of people there on a Wednesday night. I really feel we should. And especially on the Alpha, for those who are wanting to discover more about God and about becoming a soldier or moving forward in faith, the Alpha, um, and some of us, you've done it here before, Judith and I have done it for many, many years, and it's changed over the years, and it's a really quite exciting programme. Um, and it, the DVDs, I usually like to do it myself, but the DVDs are so good and uh, really clear. We're using those. And so I encourage those who, on the, and it's, it's one of those things you can invite, if somebody of your friendship group who's just inquiring about faith, you know, just who are those type of people, they're just, you know, I just wonder what it's about. This is it. This is it. The Alpha is really, it's not salvationist based, it's Christian based. And salvationist bit comes later, obviously. But I just, I'm encouraged by it. And I just want to encourage you. There's the Bible, which is Judas doing it, so it's not heavy. And then there's a doctrine group, which was asked for by the core, um, within a group doing that, Nigel and Margaret doing that. And again, that's a discussion, looking at each doctrine and then discussion. And saying that, the doctrine is not until now, until the 12th, because Nigel and Margaret are away. But you can still come and go to the one of the other fellowships, or just sit in and have a natter. I think the importance of fellowship together, Christian fellowship together, is so important. We can't do it on a Sunday. We cannot do it on a Sunday. We don't have enough time. Even if I only preach for five minutes and we cut the meeting by half, we still wouldn't have time to have fellowship. So the Wednesday night, having, and we could have another group. We could have a cooking group. We could have a car mechanic group. I'm not bothered what they are. If you want to do something on a Wednesday night and we've got the rooms, we've got still a few more rooms we can use, let's do it. So we can meet in fellowship for cake and coffee beforehand and then go into the groups and to just have fellowship. You know, it could be the, the youth want to just meet and chinwag and do youth things, whatever that is. Or it could be that the music sections want to do something other than blow an instrument. You know, it's, it's, there's, there's the option. It goes from there to there. Keep going. It's really important. But the Christian fellowship is of each other together is really important. So I just encourage you in those things. 7 o'clock every Wednesday, and it's finished by 9, 9.30. It really is. Even mine is finishes by 9, 9.30, so I don't go on. So there's worth coming to see me not going on, because it's about the people sharing together. So it's really important. So thank you for that. We're going to listen to the Bible reading, followed by the songsters. Thank you. Our reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter... <coughs> Chapter 5, starting at verse 1 through to 11. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the boat, the one belonged to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. 
When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken, and so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid, from now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Amen. Good morning. Much has been said about Her Majesty the Queen and her life of service, her life of love and faith. And we know that she served as our Queen, but she served our King. And um, I've been thinking a lot about that in recent days and her immense faith and thinking about um, how that has really helped her in her um, life's work. The song the songsters are going to bring this morning sort of turns that on its head and actually causes us to reflect upon the immense love God has for us um, as ordinary people. And the song says, How could you, the God of greatness, simply love someone like me? It must be love. Thank you. 
Tongues to these, thank you, Tongues to us, in spite of who I am. I often say that if the Lord loves me, my, he can love anyone. Absolutely. Do you still, you come to where I am. That call of God, he comes to where we are. Where we are right now, we don't have to wait for it, it's there. It's there. The call of God. Watch this video, just a short video. Each day is a new beginning. I know that the only way to live my life is to try to do what is right to take the long view, to give of my best in all that the day brings, and to put my trust in God. You know, Her Majesty is sovereign who listened to the call of God. The person didn't need to, but she did. That was all her life from that first message that Anthony mentioned on the 21st of April 1947 where she devoted her life, long or short, that she listened to God. There was a book produced by the Bible Society in 2016 on the occasion of Her Majesty's 90th birthday. And in the foreword, Her Majesty wrote, I have been and remain very grateful to you for your prayers and to God for his steadfast love. I have seen his faithfulness. Isn't that amazing that the sovereign would write? And sometimes we, we, don't, we use that book a lot to put out to people. And it was really interesting, the interest it, it created. She knew God and she heard God. This was evident in every Christmas message. And how? Because she was listening to God. There wasn't a Christmas message that didn't go by where the word God didn't come into it or the Christmas story in some way, shape or form. She never spoke about politics and how they should run. I'd love to be in some of those meetings, mind you, and, uh, and add, my, add my penny worth. I'm sure she added more than a penny worth on occasions. And she would, would never take sides. But yet, she took a side of faith, didn't she? She never took a side in politics or position or having an opinion about something. Well, sometimes in the speeches. But she firmly stood on the side of Christ. And that was unwavering absolutely unwavering because she listened to the call of God and it's not a shout by God either it's a call of God it's that inside voice and it comes when we least expect it as I said last week we were looking at the call of God with our colleagues over 103 of us going into college in 1981, 82, 82-84 sorry and um, and hearing about the God called in those days, God calls and still calls. And the privilege of hearing some of those testimonies from my colleagues was quite moving of some of the hurts and the pains that they've gone on the journey and some of who have left God and wish they hadn't and so on and so forth. It was just a great opportunity. But to hear the call of God, and sometimes it has to be a shouting. I say God doesn't shout, but sometimes he must sit on his throne, if it's a throne, I don't know what it is, and just think, oh, Painy, will you listen to me? You know? Will you listen? And then somebody tells you, you think, oh, do you, do you ever get that? Where you think you should do something because God has prompted you and you don't. And then somebody says it to you and you think, oh, really? The most unlikely person becomes the channel of God's voice if you're in tune with God. And often it's a familiar voice and we still don't listen. I can remember Beth when she was young. She was the youngest, obviously, and she had to put up with the, the boys. Catherine and her were inseparable. And, um, and sometimes when I wanted her attention, I would just hold her face and talk to her like this because she was always... But there was payback sometimes and sometimes there is now when we've met and she'd be talking and you know when you're thinking about something else and often my kids will say, Dad, Dad, then they say E and F, then I know they really want my attention. But Beth had this right at a young age. I'd be, she'd be talking about some mumbo jumbo as they do. And, you, and I wasn't listening because I was busy you know, doing something which was far more important than listening to my child. And then she would come and sit right next to me or sit on my lap and then she would hold my face and turn it to her and say, Daddy, 
I've got something to tell you. Now, there's no way you could then not listen to your daughter. All right? That he takes. And God doesn't do that, but and yet he does. Sometimes he wants to take us and, and focus that call. Because he wants us to hear what he wants to say to each and every one of us. Those moments in conversation when you're with somebody and it's terrible in Salvation Army circles, you're talking to them and they're looking over your shoulder. Ever had that? And you just think, okay, well, go and talk to them. You know, or I'll be talking to somebody and I'll just say, turnips are red. And then, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So they're not listening to me. I could do that some Sundays. When did I last mention turnips are red? Maybe. I don't know. But you know that person's mind is somewhere else. And that's all of us, because that's human nature. I do exactly the same. But it seemed easier for those first disciples, didn't they? When Jesus spoke to them directly and clearly, because it was his voice, they heard the audible voice. To Simon Peter and his companion, he says, do not be afraid, from now on you will catch people, you will catch men. Now, don't be afraid about it, because that's what's going to happen. In other places, Jesus was more specific. He says to the two followers of John the Baptist, And um, Andrew and his companion, he says, come and see. Come and see. And to Matthew, he sat at the tax booth. Follow me. To Zacchaeus, come down. To the woman who touched him. Who touched me? In the Old Testament, Genesis 3, 9, the Lord went into the Garden of Eden and he called to Adam, where are you? Exodus 3, 4, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him, Moses, from within the bush. Moses, Moses. And the response was, here I am. The call of God is littered through the scripture. And people are hearing the voice of God. The voice of God has many shapes. Being called by God is no easy thing. But knowing that you have been called and knowing what God is calling you to is even more difficult sometimes, okay? And sometimes it's easier to ignore it. The night I got saved on the 2nd of September 1979, I knew, I knew, I knew that God had called me to be a leader in the Salvation Army. Not to necessarily be an officer. I've never been called to be an officer. I've been called to be a leader, a spiritual leader. And that was very clear, very clear at that moment in conversation with Anthony, who was kneeling with me. How many of us have not wondered what and why, or even if God were calling us, if only God was clear, if only God didn't speak in whispers, if only God didn't use his inner voice, if only God appeared in a poster like Lord Kitchener, I need you. But actually, it is very clear, because when we're in tune with God, we know. We know his voice. How did God call you to be a Christian? There's a thought. Because God has called us all to be a Christian. We've come to him and he's called us. And we've given our lives to him. We've, we've laid our sin before him. We've asked for forgiveness of those things wrong in our life. And we've heard the call of God on our life. God must first call. So how can we know what God is really calling us? Or is it a figment of our imagination? Or we are simply having illusions of grandeur. I have been called by God. That deep feeling and presence. How can we know that God is calling? And we can know that God is calling us, me. Well, he's calling a group. He's calling them and he's calling them because that's a TC and that's a, a, a bishop and that's an archbishop. Of course he's calling them. But he calls us all. How can we know? I think it begins with desire, not just God's desire for us, but our desire for God. God desires us, God loves us, but do we love him? Psalm 42 says, as a deer pants for the water, so my soul pants for you, O Lord. I I desire you, God. 1 John 4, 19, we desire God because God first desired us. We loved God because God first loved us. It is this desire, it is this love, it is God's desire for us and our response, our loving desire for God, which opens us up and makes us attentive to his call. What I want to say to you, fall in love with God again. Fall in love with God as you love the Salvation Army. Fall in love with God. Desire God above anything else. 
in your life, desire God. And I really, really mean that this morning. I really mean that. Don't desire the house, the car, the marriage, whatever. That comes in because if we desire God above all things, God will look after the rest of that stuff. But we've got to desire God. We've got to love God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. How many times have I said it? I love God. And sometimes I let him down, but I still love him. Fall in love with God again and again and again and again. We don't simply choose to desire God. We fall in love with God. And here is the difference to that want. I didn't want Judith. I loved her. And I love her. I don't want her now. I love her. I love to be in her presence. I love it when we sit down and chat. I love it when we sit down and argue. I love it when we sit down and have a meal and we talk about it. I love it yesterday when the kids came over and they're gone and we're exhausted. But I love Judith with every fibre of my being. I don't desire her. I don't want her. It isn't always because we're married. I love her. So when she calls me, when we talk, I know her voice. I know her moods. I know the tone of her voice as well. Because it's that love. And do we love God that much? Here is the difference. But you know, when we love God and desire God, something else happens in our life. It becomes more fulfilled. I can remember the moment that I asked God into my life as if it were yesterday. Because something happened in my life. I can't explain what it was, but something happened that just broke everything, that cleaned me. And I had this real love for God because he'd done something. And those at the rink will tell you what a pain I was in those early days. I was at the rink nearly every day doing something because I was so grateful to God that he changed my life in some way. And I couldn't really put my finger on it, but I felt it. And the more I discovered, the more I loved Psalm 18.2, when David wrote this psalm, the Lord is my rock, my fortress and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I love you, Lord, my strength. When did we last say that? I love you, Lord, with all my strength. In spite of who I was, you still came to where I was because of love. Songs to sing it, sang it. You weren't singing a lie, were you? I hope not. You came to where I was. Remember the time when you fell in love? I'll let you daydream for these few moments. And you said those three words, I love you. I can remember when I said it. I'm not going to tell you where it was or how it happened, because that's between me and Judith. We were in a VW convertible. Driving through the streets of London. I remember it. I was nervous to say it. And it was a bit, my palms were sweaty, but I knew I loved her. My heart was... And I just said, I love you. What do you say? <laughs> I love you too. Remember those words? Bev, do you remember? Marjorie, do you remember? Yeah. Because you'd never forget, do you? Because you love each other. Well, Sorry? It's yeah, absolutely. Mrs. Pennington, do you remember? Yeah, I'm sure you do. <laughs> we do. And every one of us, our love is different for each other. Totally different. Of course it is. When we fall in love with God, when we hear his call and understand his voice saying, I love you, a whole world is turned upside down. And we then realise the object of our desire in God. It starts with you and me. That's where it all starts. We need to be willing to be called by God. If you're not willing and you have no interest, if you're, if you're reluctant or hesitant or resistance, you won't hear the voice of God. It's a love and relation. It's a two-way thing. You know, I, I feel sad when... 
people get divorced. It happens, doesn't it? It's happened in our family. And I've sat down with my two and I've chatted to them about it. Dad to daughter, dad to son. Don't know what it is, Dad. We just don't talk a minute. I don't love her anymore. And blah, 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 blah. And you're going through the questions. At what point was it? I don't know. Was it because of the lack of communication and the lack of conversation with each other? I don't know. But actually, if you don't have that conversation, that relationship with God, you fall out and you fall on the wayside. What's the analogy? You fall amongst the weeds. Like those first disciples, we need to be willing. Immediately he followed. Immediately Zacchaeus came down. Immediately there is urgency. We need to be open to the possibility that God may indeed be calling your name now, today. Could be calling your name. Could be saying David, Heather, Cammy, Steve, Estelle, Trevor. That God could be calling your name. Just that inner, inner voice. Like Matthew, Zacchaeus, Andrew and Philip. They were all willing, willing to follow, willing to trust, willing to believe. In order to hear the voice of God calling us, we need to be willing to be open to the possibility that God is and does call us. That God would call me in the state I'm in at the moment. That God would call me. In spite of me, my suspicion, my faults and everything about me, God still wants to fall in love with you and wants you to fall in love with him. So not only is our desire for God necessary, but also our willingness to hear him. And there is just one more thing, I think. There is one more ingredient in our ability to hear God calling. We need to be ready. We need to be ready to respond to the call of God. I'm always amazed by the immediate response that those first disciples made. And Paul read it from our scripture from Luke and all the catch and the miracle and everything that happened and they brought the boats and when they brought the boats ashore they left everything and followed him. They left everything and followed him. You sort of think, really? They just had the greatest catch in their life and they could make loads and loads of money and he says, follow me and off they go. From the ordinary to the extraordinary. God had such a way that he didn't want their lives to be ordinary, just catching fish. He wanted them to be extraordinary in what they were going to be doing. Nor for Isaiah was there any question. He was ready and ready in that moment. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And and I said, Here am I, send me. Talking to a burning bush. (laughs) I'm not sure I'd have said, Send me. (laughs) Call the fire brigade. I don't know. But he said... Here am I, send me immediately. There was that response because he knew it was the call of God. He was ready at that moment. Ready to go wherever God had sent him. And even where he probably did not want to go. I remember when the DC said to me, I was coming to Chatham. I said, really? I said, you're having a jolly? He said, no, no. I said, I can't do Chatham. He said, far too big. I'll go to Horsham and be the airport chaplain. The little call will be fine. He said, no, I really feel God is calling you to Chatham. And I'm absolutely sure he did. 100 million percent. Some of you might disagree with that, but you're allowed to. But I believe with every fibre of my being that had I been a bit more ready and a bit more open and a bit more willing to what God wanted of my life, instead of trying to sort it out for the army on their behalf, that God was clear. And it was soon made clear by God to me very quickly here. There was no questions for the disciples to say to Jesus, I can't, I'm not ready, come back tomorrow. Or next week, or next year. Let me just get on with this. There was no question of Isaiah saying to God, I can't, I'm not ready, this is too hard, or Moses. No, when they were called, they came. They came ashore, left everything and followed. When they called, when they heard the call, they responded. To be perfectly honest, for many, that's the hardest thing. Having a real desire for God, being really open and willing to hear God speak my name and call me to whatever that is. Sometimes it's not a call to action. It's a call for your life to be different to what it is. So it's not all about, I'm calling you to run this and do this and pick up this and do that. No, it's... I'm calling you because I want something specific in your life. I want you to focus on me, to be in that place spiritually. But am I ready to follow where he leads? That's the hardest part. And I think Jesus knows that because he keeps calling. 
Slowly and surely, we get ourselves ready to respond to whatever is next in the history of our core. And in your history, in your desire, in your willingness, and to be ready. So what about you? Do you desire to be called by God? Can you hear God whispering your name even now? Are you willing to be called by God? Are you ready to be called by God? I think we know. I think we know. I think we can. We can. There's an old songster song. I love it. I had to dig it up, literally, from an old tape recording. Thou hast called me by thy name. We're going to reflect on this song. And if it's your place to come to the mercy seat, do that. That God is calling you, that you've lost the desire slightly, or you've just hearing that call, or whatever. It would be very private, but this morning, let's renew that covenant with God, that calling, that desire, that willingness, and to be ready to do whatever you want. You can come and sit, you can come and stand, you can come and kneel. I'm not really worried how you do it, but actually here's the place where we spoke only by grace. That's the hardest thing sometimes, is, is, is getting that grace to come forward and just say, yeah, here's the place. Let's reflect, let's respond to what God is saying. <laughs> Thou hast called me, thank you, Lord. <clears throat> we are ransomed and we are forgiven. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for our worship this morning. You've spoken clearly into many hearts, that I believe. 
May we respond, whatever that is you want us to do this morning, Lord, however you want us to respond. Just ask, Lord, that you will lead us to that place. We love you beyond all measure, Lord, and if we don't, we've got to put that right. If we're struggling with our faith and in our daily walk, we've got to put that right. But we can only put that right by having a conversation with you, Father. So we come to you this morning, Lord, whether in the hall or at home, in the comfort of our homes, and we just say, yeah, you have called us, Lord, you have blessed us. And these days have been challenging, these years have been challenging in faith. But this morning we just want to hear your voice again, calling directing us. We want to renew that relationship, that deeper relationship with you and to know your grace in our lives in these days. So Lord, hear our prayers, we pray. Those spoken, but all those deep in our hearts that have been made in these last few moments, that we sense your power moving through this place and in our hearts and in our lives. And for some, we may not understand it. For others, it may be yet another blessing that we're receiving from you. We thank you for it, Lord. And we pray our prayers in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's share our last song together, shall we? <clears throat> Who is on the Lord's side? How many verses is it, Anthony? I can't remember. Oh, four. We'll have three. We'll have first verses one and two in the last. One and... Because it's one, two, and four. One, two, and four. Can you work that out? If the band's all right, they just have to keep playing. Okay, let's stand together. One, two, and four. Who is on the Lord's side? Thank you, Ryan. <laughs>
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the presence of God, the power of God, and his blessing be in our lives. His call forever be in our ears as we move from this place and his blessing go with us in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning and God bless you.